Hello, Paul. Hello, Bob. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you for asking, sir. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright, proprietor of the not proprietor of the Non-Zero newsletter. This is a Non-Zero podcast. You're Paul Bloom, proprietor of the falsely modest newsletter, Small Potatoes, and also a professor of psychology at the University of Toronto. I am all that. Co correct so far. Author of many books. Many. Too, too many, many to count. Too many to count or name. Um, by the way, uh, have you actually met Jeffrey Hinton, one of your colleagues at the University of Toronto? I met him. He will, he will not remember this, but I met him when he was when I was a graduate student at MIT. He came and gave really, and, yeah. Now he, he is sometimes he's been called by the New York Times the Godfather of artificial intelligence. Some might dispute that, but he's definitely you know. Here's a little known fact, not to pull rank on you, but I interviewed him in 1983 mm. for a piece I was writing about AI. I, I wound up not quoting him in the piece, regrettably, but I do remember talking to him. And he was at that point uh, advocating this, this besieged insurrectionist minority approach to AI. He was, it was not at all mainstream. And he turned out to be right. And that's the, his approach, broadly speaking, is behind the large language models that have gotten so much attention. And Tell me about your own encounter with him. I don't remember, and I'm sure he remembers it less, but he was at the time sort of the enemy. I, 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 the, the, the notion of AI that people at MIT took seriously was much more of a symbolic one. Symbolic was, logic. It's very strongly influenced by Steve Pinker, who argued for the limitations of these sort of associations and neural networks. Uh, you know, that's funny. That's interesting. I mean, yeah. Steve surely knows that the mind is not an actual logic machine. Well, what Steve would argue, and I would argue too, and Gary Marcus too, is that the mind is many things. And one thing the mind is, is the big associative network. A statistical right. learning machine. But right. another thing to mind is, is in fact a logic engine. It does symbolic reasoning and symbolic calculations. And Steve was involved for, and Gary Marcus too, for in a long time for a very acrimonious debate about English past tense, where many uh, neural network modelers argued as simply as a matter of an association for what, what a present tense past tense for what was on. Steve argued, I think very convincingly, that it, there are associations, but there are also rules. Uh, rules. Now, now, wait, maybe I missed something. Rules behind grammar or rules? Yeah. Rules so behind. He was, he was a Chomskyite kind of. Yes, that's right. That's right. Yeah, and, well, there are kind, there are rules to grammar, but we don't think about them explicitly. Uh, we don't no, have to in order no. to speak uh, language. And, and they're not that rigorous. They're kind of weird with a lot of fluky exceptions and stuff. It's a kind of a... Kind of a sloppy well, system, if you ask me. I mean, the general idea, it's, you, you present it outside of the past tense. I think this is one of the, the Steve's examples, which is you take, you have these prototypes of things due to associations, your stereotypical grandmother and grandfather. Um, I discovered that very early in his life, Pierce Brosnan was a grandfather. When he was playing James Bond, he was in fact a grandfather. I think I missed a transition here. Uh, no, 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 you'll, you'll get it, you'll get it, you'll get it. Uh, okay, okay, okay. So there's, there's, there's an association, a set of associations, your typical grandmother, typical grandfather. But then alongside that, there's a rule. A grandmother is, you know, is the, the mother of a, of, of a mother or father, mother of a parent. Mm -hmm. The grandfather is the father of a parent. Mm -hmm. And we have them both alongside each other. We can say that's typical, but not really a grandmother. And that's uh, atypical, but really a grandfather. Okay. No, I, it's all true, but, ah, oh, man, I don't know. Anyway, look, I, I actually have a podcast uh, scheduled for far in the future with Gary Marcus, so I'll talk to him about that. Ah, uh, he'll, he'll set you straight. What's that? He'll set you straight on so many things. He, he will, indeed. He, he, he brooks no dissent. Um, <laughs> And uh, so I will, I, I would just like to surrender in advance, but it seems to me that the kind of neural network approach has been pretty effective, but we'll see. You know, I, I'll, I'll confess something, which is I, I, I still hold on to certain ideas, which I think uh, are still in, in the ballpark, but the success of these chatbots of GPT being whatever is the biggest surprise in my intellectual life. And, and, and I'll, I could put it a, di a different way. Boy, was I wrong. 
Well, I, would not, thing, I would not have thought this would have ever happened. It would have happened 20 years from now, 30 years from now. That is happening now that I could have a machine I could just talk to and could do what it does and, you know, help me write reference letters, which is what I'm doing this morning. I would have. Did you, thought, you use AI to do it to help you this morning? Just just to provide some bios of people. Just I wrote the letter myself. Would you like to tell people who the person is whose no. reference letter is basically <laughs> fake? Now I'm worried that this person may well be watching this and say, hey, um, in fact, when I asked it, I wanted to say, can you write me a draft of a reference letter for so and so? Who it would find out? I can't do that. It says, I don't know the person personally. So I said, what if you wrote me a bio that looks a lot like a reference letter? Oh, sure. Boom. Cool. Mm -hmm. Have but, you ever have you ever signed one of those letters designed to get somebody a visa? Yes. Or lawyers draft them? Yes. It's like, this person makes Jesus Christ look like, you know, nobody, basically. They're yeah. unbelievable how extravagant they have to be, apparently, to be effective. Anyway, we digress. Now, we were we were going to get around to talking about AI, but then there's also these kind of more newsworthy things, somewhat more immediately newsworthy, college presidents getting fired, or yeah. at least one of the three, Elon Musk. You wrote a piece from New Yorker about AI that we definitely have to get around and discuss it. Yeah. But I will leave it to you. What order we go in here? So, so first, first, an apology from for last two things about last episode. One oh, is, did you fuck up on my podcast, Paul? I fucked up big. I made a joke about Mickey Kaus that he was at. That he was, part he was, I applaud. What, he was, what? No, 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 no. I said my joke is he was hiking the Adirondack Trail. Oh, Paul, you were too kind to correct me, but, but I did later, notice it actually later on. I felt like such a more. It was, of course, the Appalachian. Trail is a joke. Mm -hmm. And of course, because the Appalachian Trail was the excuse given by some senator, congressman, politician for cavorting with his um with with his uh, illicit partner in Costa Rica or something. When when people demanded to know where he was, he said he was hiking the Appalachian, the uh, Appalachian Trail. Or a spokesperson maybe said that yeah. for him. I'm not sure. But yeah. it turned out to have been only metaphorically true at best. Yes, yes. But it's a wonderful metaphor for an it illicit is. love affair. And I speak as someone who has uh, hiked the Appalachian Trail only non-metaphorically. And I can tell you, that's a great, it's a great looking metaphor. Um, so. Um, and also, also I want to say, this is going to frame the rest of our discussion. A friend of mine listened to our last discussion and said, I, I act too much like I'm a host on your podcast. And I got to be more assertive. If, I encourage if, that. If, if, if that's, encourage if that's that. okay with you, you know. You know, this is, could I just pause and say, this is blanket advice for Canadians. You have to be more assertive. Okay. It's not just you. All of your countrymen and women and others have to be more assertive. Okay. I'll take that seriously. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Well, you're thank not you, getting Bob. off to thank a very you. good thank start. You. I got to say. For, thank you for constructive advice. <laughs> you were supposed advice. to challenge that, Paul. How, oh, dare, you. how dare you generalize about my, anyway. Yeah. Um, so what are we going to talk about? Go ahead. The, take take the reins. Well, okay. I'm going to take the reins. Yeah. Uh, I was listening to you on an, in another podcast. I forget who you're talking to. You're talking about the three university presidents and their atrocious behavior uh, testifying to a national audience. One of them, the president of Penn, has now lost her job. Mm -hmm. um, maybe, maybe I don't know what, Harvard maybe soon to go. A lot of pressure. And And I agreed with a lot of people that they did a very poor job. I did read this thing by Michelle Goldberg, which clarified it a bit, which pointed mm -hmm. out that the clip that everybody saw was at the end of a very acrimonious, many-hour argument taken somewhat out of context. And and it wasn't, the performance wasn't as bad as um, as as it looked. And in case there's anyone who missed it, uh, Stefanik, yeah. this congresswoman said, if a student uh, advocates genocide against the Jews, what do you do and uh and they 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 were more focused on the first uh, protecting first amendment rights than suggesting that they would have a problem with that yeah uh, and everybody could do right now could give a and i've heard so many people that well this is what i would have said yeah and, and, and i did that and you object to the way i did it and i did actually because well, Should we I say what said, I said? Should we say what I said? Yeah, why don't you say what I you defer said? to you. You're you're in charge. You, but we, okay. What you, what you said is, um, if I was the university, I say, look, you know, actually, you can't do this on my campus. My campus is a private university. I'm not. It's not First Amendment rules. I kick your ass out of the university if you advocated for genocide of any group. That's that not I, all I said. That's not all said, I said. More. And and I think what I said gets it. 
part of what their constraint was, I think part of their constraint was apparently they had been lawyered to death going yeah. into this and they had their talking points. But I think the thing that needs to be said is, I mean, first of all, Michelle Goldberg in her column emphasized that the question had the question about about genocide had come after Stefanik saying, you know, they're saying from the river to the sea, they're saying global intifada. And and she was asserting that that was tantamount, that those two things were both tantamount to advocating genocide against the Jews. And, and and so they had apparently wrestled over that stuff and they had said, well, you can say from, yeah, I know, river from the sea yeah. is protected, river to the sea is protected speech and so on. And then as they segued into the generic version, or, or well, I wouldn't call it the generic version because I don't accept the idea by any means that uh, river to the sea is tantamount to calling for genocide. But um, but anyways, they segued into that phraseology. Uh, the college president stuck with their talking points, kind yeah. of. And I was just saying what I would have said is, well, I would have said if they literally explicitly advocate killing all the members of any ethnic group, they do not belong at my university. And I would, you know, I, I, I but the, the, the challenge comes in deciding what is and isn't tantamount to saying that if they don't yeah. say it explicitly. And different people mean different things by from the river to the sea and even by global intifada. I think some I think some people who say that, I mean, this is not what I would have said as the college president. I'm just saying this. I think they mean global struggle against imperialism, settler colonialism, blah, 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 overthrow the regime kind of thing. They don't mean kill all the Jews in the world, although I can certainly understand why Jews, especially Israeli Jews, would take it that way. Anyway. Uh, and there was the, some sort of poll that said when they say from the river to the sea, they are very poor at figuring out what river and what sea, and they don't. You oh, know, they, they? They, they, it's just it's just a nice rhyming sort of. <laughs> thing. Yeah, no, I mean, half of these demonstrators are like, uh, I don't know. It seemed like all the cool kids were going to be at the demonstration, so, uh, yeah. but maybe not half, but some. Um, so anyway, that was the full version. But uh, you're going to challenge the initial assertion yeah. that a college president can say. Go ahead. Challenge me. So, so I've been wrestling with it because initially I, 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 I don't know. I, I have been wrestling with what the right answer to this isn't the right policy. And I've decided to go kind of pretty much free speech absolutist, which mm -hmm. would involve some degree of what they said. It depends on the context. So, so if you're, if you're threatening, harassing somebody standing in front of their door, interrupting their class and everything like that, universities for any issue, can say, you can't do that. You cannot harass individuals. You cannot bully individuals. On the other hand, I actually think, and this is, I'll put this down as a fairly controversial opinion. A lot of my friends would disagree, but you could have a demonstration of students who are saying, let's kill all the Jews. Let's kill all the black people. Let's kill all the trans people. And I think, I don't think they should be kicked off campus for doing so, I think universities should adopt a First Amendment policy for, for speech, and they should allow the most disgusting and awful speech to take place. Um, and one reason why you should agree with me on that, it occurs to me, was because if you do say, look, for calling for genocide, that is excluded, then a lot of people will say, well, from the river to sea is a call for genocide. Let's make it as a judgment call. So let's exclude that. And then so I think it's better to say, they can say anything. As mm -hmm. long as it's not threatening individuals, disrupting things. And that's how it goes. Yeah, I mean, let me say, first of all, my, my main point was kind of that, that it would be good for people to not accept the premise that these yeah. other two utterances are tantamount to call for genocide. So I could imagine a university president saying, when Stefanik said the thing about genocide, saying, well, you know, with all due respect, the premise for you, for this question is your prior assertion that these two things are tantamount to that. And I'm here to tell you, these two things mean different things to different people. Yeah. And whenever that's the case, it's very hard to step in and do things without violating First Amendment rights. They could have just said that. That would have been an improvement. Yeah. But uh, but I would say, as far as whether you can say calling for the killing of any everyone in any group uh, is allowed, there are laws, at least in the books of some states, I think, uh, about what's called making terrorist threats. You're not yeah. allowed to threaten to kill an individual. Now, I don't know if threatening to kill 
And I suppose advocating the killing is maybe different from threatening to kill, but uh, it's not totally clear to me that an explicit call to kill all the members of a given ethnic group would not uh, be interpreted as falling under that rubric of making terrorist threats. I don't know. I'm not a First Amendment attorney. Half of my point was that the college president should have been creative enough in the yes. moment to separate these two questions. Yes. And also, they, they should have been upfront if they if they knew this was going to be be so viral. Upfront, the idea, what an appalling, horrible thing to say. I wholeheartedly disapprove of it. I wholeheartedly support, uh, you know, da, 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 any students who well, were offended. The, the by Harvard this. professor did say a lot of that. They probably yeah. all did at one point or another. But even in the circulated clips, she did. Yeah. I personally find it abhorrent. In fact, I think she said that about Global Intifada, let alone... Is, yeah, though that wasn't yeah. one of the major clips that, that went around, but she did say that. Okay. Anyway, I've, I've now moved to becoming sympathetic towards them because it strikes me that it depends is actually kind of depends on context. It's kind of the right answer. And people are angry at them for two opposing reasons. They've hit this sort of perfect storm. People are furious at them for not saying, oh, my God, I'd expel any student who said such a thing. A lot mm -hmm. of people would want to say at the same time. I think people who are more free speech oriented are furious at them for what they see as the hypocrisy mm -hmm. of this, which is yeah. that that if the example was the KKK going through the campus or somebody saying bad things about trans people, um, they would not say it depends on context. They would they would wholeheartedly reject it. So it's as if there's a different standard for the Jews right. and people are responding to that. Now, I would say on my behalf, on behalf of my position, that. If the president of Penn had said either of the two things I suggested, either formulation, either you know, if they, uh, genocide, no go, but these other things are arguably different, or just the premise of your question is that genocide is tantamount, blah, blah, blah. Either way, she would still yeah. be president of Penn. That's right. That's so, right. again, yeah. always come to me for guidance. <laughs> Better this than the any main, old lawyers. Yeah, always. Always come to this podcast for guidance before you before you testify before Congress. Not after, folks. It's too late then. I was listening to a, a law a law podcast, and they were saying that this is what you get when you listen to lawyers, because lawyers will tell you, will say, avoid liability. Do not do not apologize. Do not admit sympathy for certain groups. And that could be great advice if your number one priority in life is avoiding liability. Right. For the unit, they have other priorities. Yeah, like keeping your jobs. Yeah. Keeping your jobs is a big one. Yep. So well, also, also in Penn, by the way, I think a, a, somebody who had promised a $100 million donation backed out unless, uh, unless the president was removed. He threatened to back out. He yeah. said, uh, yeah, that, that uh, you're not getting this $100 million. I That led me to believe that they wouldn't uh, buckle under and fire her because it just looks so bad. You know, doesn't it look kind of bad? It looks like, awful. And look, their endowment, I looked it up. Their endowment is like 20 billion. They could get by. They could yeah. get by. They could they could find that hundred million if they had already already had plans for it. Still a hundred million here, hundred million 100 there. Million there. Pretty soon, soon you're talking about real money. Pretty soon you're raising tuition by five dollars. You know, she was already under pressure uh yeah. from on these issues. She had allowed a Palestinian literary conference to go through even though two of the speakers were deemed objectionable by the kinds of people who threatened to withdraw a hundred million dollars. Yeah. So so um, we resolve that one. Yeah. Uh, I think I think by the way the effect of all of this is going to be um universities are now going to repress more and more speech. They're going to take the wrong lesson from this. Well that see that's my objection that's why I wanted her to distinguish between the question of genocide and the other two things. Because the goal of these people is to stifle expressions like from the river to the sea. Yeah. And that's not productive because it's just going to get the, the pro-Palestine side more riled up. It's also not, not productive because I think, I think calling an end to Israel, calling for an end to Israel, I very strongly disagree with it. But actually, I think people should be allowed to argue about the existence of nation states or not. Well, and, yeah. and, 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 I, and, I, and I understand, I mean, a lot of my friends say, well, you're, 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 it's tantamount to calling for Jewish genocide. But, but you should have a lot of latitude to say awful and weird and, and things. Yeah, but I mean, I would say this, the range of interpretations of that phrase includes uh, 
every Palestinian in that area should be allowed to vote, period, mm -hmm. uh, if everyone else is. That's one. Now, you can say, well, you play that out, it ultimately leads yeah. to the end of Zionism. Well, okay, but the end of Zionism, uh, you know, then it would be a different kind of state. You can imagine yeah. a world where, where the, you know, it's, you know, anyway, it's a long, it's a long, I've written about this somewhere. In the I, I'm aware of this. There is, uh, I wrote a piece called uh, the, uh, from the river to the sea Rorschach test. And I, in my newsletter, I encourage people to read it. Anything you'd like to plug in small potatoes, that could be a, a, a genius level segue to our next topic, Paul. Um, a little no. while ago, I have, <laughs> no, 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 but I'm just going to, I'm going to help you with this. But... Say small potatoes over and over again. Yeah. Um, well, we're going to talk about Elon Musk. Which I uh, I talked about him in the context at one point of reviewing uh, Walter Isaacson's bi uh, biography, whom you and I have mm. talked about. But but he has gone on to do more and more um, flamboyant behavior. By the way, Alex Jones is back back on yeah. X. Yeah. In fact, he had a conference, uh, some kind of conference thing with a live stream with Elon and uh, Ramaswamy, Vivek Ramaswamy. And tell me something. How many meanings can you think of for the term live stream? <laughs> that's good. I like that. Now go ahead. Did you go read ahead. about explain. what happened? I did, I did. I did read about that. But, uh, Ramaswamy, you could hear him urinating. That's bad form for a presidential candidate. I wonder. I could. I can imagine it as a mistake. People have made this mistake many times. They just have a live mic and they forget about it. But if it was done not as a mistake, it's very aggressive. Ramaswamy is not, he's not shy in retirement. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a power move. It was a, it was, it was a power move. You know, they say LBJ, they consider this is. a power move. He used to, you're aware of this? I've heard LBJ stories. Go ahead. He'd be on the toilet doing his business, so to speak. And, and he would leave the bathroom door open and have like an aide on the other side that he was like giving dictation to or discussing things with. And people said that was a power move. That seems that seems like a power move to intimidate, and it is a very LBJ like. Yeah, yeah, it's um, good. It, it's, so so where we had, Elon Musk? He's, oh yes, I'm sorry. I, I'll shut up. You're in charge of this podcast. I yeah. keep taking us off. off yes. Yeah. So um, so what did you think of Elon Musk's performance on uh, in his interview with uh, Sorkin? With Sorkin. Uh, you remember his name. Elon said, it's only <laughs> Elon, good friend. Said, Elon said, look, the reason I'm doing this interview is because you're my friend, Jonathan. And Sorkin said, my name is Andrew. That is such, was, that is such good. It, 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 when you hear it, it's, it's it has it, like it's like a bit. It, it is. Good. Elon is like a bit. Uh, so, I mean, it goes back to that weird response. I even wrote this down on Twitter. This was the first time, actually that I thought maybe he actually is mentally ill. It was that anti-Semitic tweet he embraced. I got to read the whole tweet because afterwards, uh, Musk, Musk replies to this tweet, you have said the actual truth, okay? Publicly, he replied to the, and here's the tweet. <clears throat> the tweet was replying to, well, it was doesn't matter. Uh, but the tweet, was Jewish communities have been pushing the exact kind of dialectical hatred against the whites that they claim to want people to stop using against them. I'm deeply disinterested. He means uninterested, Paul, but I digress. I'm deeply disinterested in giving the tiniest shit now about Western Jewish populations coming to the disturbing realization that those hordes of minorities that support flooding their country don't exactly like them too much. You want truth said to your face? There it is. And Musk replies, you have said the actual truth. Like, how underdeveloped would your political antenna have to be for you, even if you believed he had said the yeah. actual truth, to like say that? Yeah, it does seem fairly anti-Semitic. What is it? That's great replacement theory. Yeah, I think so. Um, the the anti-Semitic version of it, which it's is just Jews, got a lot of red light flashing. Jews red are lights. encouraging a lot of immigration so that we we get rid, rid rid of the white people. Yeah, that was the philosophy behind the Tree of Life shooting. In yeah. Pittsburgh. Yes. And, and, then, that guy and, was, then, and then this tweet you just read adds to it the special part. So now we we deserve what we get from all these non-white right. people. Yeah, so that's, I, that's pretty bad. When I saw that, I was like, I 
don't even have a theory for what's actually going on to his uh, brain. Now, in elaborating, he said uh, uh, later, I guess after getting in trouble, he said, you're right that this does not extend to all. He was considered, somebody said, you're generalizing Elon or something. He said, you're right that this does not extend to all Jewish communities, but it is also not just limited to ADL, meaning the Anti-Defamation uh, League. Uh, I'm deeply offended by ADL's messaging and any other groups who push de facto anti-white racism or whatever. See, now my theory is, so he, I think he was pissed off at the ADL because he thinks yeah. they were getting advertisers to abandon him because he was permitting anti-Semitism, like before this tweet, okay? And so he's got this anti-ADL thing, uh, which I'm not necessarily against, but I have other reasons for not liking the ADL myself. So he's got this ADL thing, anti-ADL thing, and then a separate criticism of the ADL you hear is that they're too woke. Okay, this is Barry Weiss makes this criticism. So I think he had latched onto that in his anti-ADLism. And that's kind of what he's talking about here. The, yeah. Anyway, this is just my theory. And then and then maybe so maybe he did have in mind the ADL when he replied to this tweet tweet. He was he was he was actually pissed off at them. And he somewhat overgeneralized, you might say. A little bit. He, I don't know. He, that... apolog he apologized for a tweet in this television interview with Sorkin. I guess maybe it was that, that was one. This, uh, it was the, you have said the actual truth tweet. Yes. Yeah, he, he did apologize quite profusely and, you know, straightforwardly. He, that's a good news up. about his performance at that interview. Yes. Now you might want to comment on other aspects. So the bad news is when reminded he was losing advertisers, he said something to that I'm not going to be bullied. I won't be blackmailed. And he said, you know, to anybody who, um, Really, to Bob Iger uh, from Disney, I guess you should go go fuck yourself. And then he yeah. repeated it, and then he yeah. said it. He then he said GFY for those who have who missed it. And and Sorkin's like startled, and he says, "Well, don't you want advertisers?" And Musk says, "No, no, no, they'll all leave us. They'll all leave us, and we'll go out of business." Yeah. And so he says, "Well, well, you know." It's, well, isn't this bad? He was even the lost of words. Like I and and Musk says. Earth will judge. It'll be the judgment of Earth. Yeah, Meaning, says, I guess, that after X is out of business, the people of Earth will judge that this was a horrible thing. Yeah, see, so first he says, in between those two things, he says, and, you know, we've got the receipts. We're going to show exactly what happened here. And I'm thinking, you know, if all you're trying to establish is that losing all your advertising revenue is bad for your business, you don't really have to show your work. I kind of get the basic idea here. But but now I think... I, I thought the receipts may be groups like ADL encouraging other that's, advertisers. That's what I to. think he had in mind. That's yeah. what he means is we're going to show that this actually was the behind the scenes. There was this orchestration. And then twice he he made this Earth, Earth reference. He, and, and he says, tell it to Earth. And that now you tell me you're the you're the famous psychologist. Uh, it, it, did that like when you if you're trying to figure out his psychopathology, did that those two references to Earth did they that you know there's no, there's no there's no clear marks of mental illness from a single phrase, but tell it to Earth is really if there was that would be one. Some people have speculated that he was not um, in his right mind. When he did the interview, he didn't, he didn't look well. He he, um, look well. he he may have been on some sort of drug. Yeah, I think he he has been known to be on ketamine. Yeah, and I don't know what maybe this is an effect of ketamine. Who knows? But what do you? But specifically, like what bells did it ring? This stuff about planet Earth. I have see we have speculated in the past that perhaps narcissism is one uh, thing you word you could apply to him. Uh, this is, I mean, I think that's consistent with this. Yeah. But I also thought, and this is obvious, I mean, that he's got a, a serious messiah complex. Yeah. Um, and I think the earth thing is like, it's like, you know, yeah, yeah. Go tell the people of earth. I'm the fucking savior of this planet. Go tell it to the planet that you're undermining me. I think that's the logic. And I think it, in, in some way to, to take his side on it, he is the savior of the planet. His, his goal is not to make more and more money. It's pretty clear from his behavior. The money is 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 not is is not a thing. His goal is that we become uh, interplanetary species. 
Mm-hmm. He's had this wish from a, for a very long time. And this ties together Tesla, certainly SpaceX. Um, Twitter, it's hard to see the connection. But um, he wants us to become an interplanetary species. He really does see us, see himself as our savior. Yeah, and he, and he thinks it's critical that we populate the other planets before Earth implodes. Ben, and, you know. I think he's fine with it eventually imploding. Uh, I mean, I mean, he's willing to accept that maybe the planet won't survive. The key is to keep the light of consciousness as uh, what's his name? Uh, the former former owner of tw- or former CEO of Twitter said uh, Elon would uh, sustain uh, in the course of owning Twitter. Um, you know, I mean, that, the, that- the, the interplanetary thing. It's not crazy. It, it's it's Will McCaskill's argument too, which is once we colonize a few planets, once we get out in space and get seriously settled in them, then human survival, the chances of human survival, multiplies enormously. Mm-hmm. Because then, oh. then, then any catastrophe, humanity will will still survive. Yeah, uh, that that's the idea. I mean, this is uh, which is kind of a natural segue to AI. We got some good segues yeah. going here. But just segueing it up, yeah. This the, is this is why I can't really run the podcast because I I'd be very like, okay, now let's talk about AI. Or let's move to, and you just segue. Because for me, it's just seamless. And to people don't even realize it's a segue because I don't mention it. It just happens. You have done so many of these. I just, it's just, it's the 10,000 hour rule or something. It's effortless. It's like DiMaggio in his, in his prime, some people <laughs> say. It's the metaphor that goes around. Although actually he didn't, he knew when to retire, unlike me. He, he retired. Uh, my father used to marvel that he, he said, the thing about DiMaggio is he saw when he was going downhill and he got out of the game. I didn't do that, Paul. Well, that that implies you're going downhill. I see no signs of that. Oh, that's so nice of you. Are you Canadian? Are you Canadian? It's, it's, it's still be Canadian. I um, mean, the story I think of is is, is Seinfeld because you know, imagine was in a physical game. Seinfeld, you know, was running a, a sitcom, and I only got bags and bags of money to keep going. He said, "No, it's time." That's true. My hat's off to him. That's an all too uh, all too rare thing. I can think of occupants of the White House who don't uh, carry that philosophy into life. You believe our, our current president should say, "I got my term. I become president." Well, now that you mention it, Biden is an example. Yeah, I think kind of so. I don't know if anybody's brought attention to this, but he's somewhat old. Huh? I, I uh, you, you, so many new perspectives are being illuminated. You're right. He is. Yeah. Um, well. So, so, this AI, so you mentioned Will McCaskill. Maybe not everybody knows that he's like the philosopher of long-termism or one of several. The idea that we should pay a lot of attention to existential risk, the possibility that life on this planet could get snuffed out. Um, we should guard against that. Um, and, you know, AI is, has been the context for a lot of discussion of this. And uh, you wrote about AI for The New Yorker. I did. It was fun. It was my first time writing about AI seriously, and I put a lot of a lot of effort, a lot of thought into it. And mm-hmm. you know, I had a very good editor. And who was um, your editor? Probably nobody I know. Oh fuck! Never no, mind. I, never mind. Never mind. I didn't mean to do that to can, you. Can you cut this part out? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it's not as bad. You know, one thing we did cut out yeah. long ago when this was called Blogging Heads. So yeah. it was. Uh, Ben Smith and Glenn Greenwald were having a conversation on blogging heads on our platform. Uh, and Ben Smith referred, was it Politico at that point? He referred to the owner of Politico as being dead. The owner of the media company he worked for as being dead. He was not dead. He was not dead. Ben asked if we could cut that out. I said, only if Glenn Greenwald agrees. And we checked with Glenn. He said, sure. Paul, I say to you, we can cut that out if I agree. I don't agree. That's fair enough, because it was Daniel Gross who was... Wait, that, is Dan Gross the former bus- the business writer guy? Is he the New Yorker or a different Dan Gross? I don't know which Dan Gross he is. And I always call him Daniel. I have a Dan Gross friend who's uh, kind of a business writer guy. Who knows? I've lost track of him. I have been edited by um, a few people there, and they're all excellent. They're just mm-hmm. really, and, and it makes everything, you know, one of the fun things about a Substack, like 
small potatoes is that you just write it down and you have GPT for proofread and then you're off. Uh-huh. But, but one of the good things about the New Yorker is they make your writing really good and then they fact check it. And, um, you know, I, I had this story in my, in my, in my New Yorker article where I talked to some guy and he told me something. And I just said, so some guy told me this. And, he's, and the fact says, who's the guy? I want to call him up and see if he told you that. And I love that. Wow. There are not many places that will do that for you. The New Yorker does it. The Atlantic does it, at least for the magazine articles. I'm not sure for the online stuff. For the, for the physical magazine. Yeah. Yeah. No, they but, used to be super intensive, the, the Atlantic, and maybe they still are for the magazine. Actually, hmm. I've written for the physical magazine uh, within the last decade, and uh, it wasn't what it once was. But I'm sure they are uh, better than most. Um, so the New Yorkers are thrilled to write for. It's, it's, I, I, I will never turn them down. And so I got to think about alignment. And the alignment problem, as you know, is, is everybody worries about AI. You either worry it's going to kill everybody. Uh-huh. Which the, the the doomers, which some not insignificant proportion of people in the field really think there's a serious chance it will kill us all, or you worry about that'll put everybody out of work. You worry that 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 bad actors will use it to make uh, uh, to cause another pandemic, to foment hate over social media. Everybody has something to worry about for AI, and. You look at different solutions. Uh, people who don't know what they're talking about says we could always unplug it. We could always put it in a box, and that's not very good. But the solution everybody is playing with is you build in some degree of moral alignment with people, mm-hmm. and uh, so that so that it says you know well you know I, I was just asked to work on the problem of global warming. If I kill everybody, that will solve the problem. So I'm going to kill everybody. And it does that in a fraction of a second. They have a part which then steps in and says, but wait, that would be wrong. So I'm not going to do that. Mm-hmm. And so what I do in articles, I review different approaches to alignment. Um, and then I end, and this is the part which I also explore a bit more in my Substack. I end by, by thinking of something this uh, philosopher, Eric Schwitzkibble, a very, very sharp guy, says, this says, we, we, a lot of people are trying to align AI with human moral values, but human moral values often, often suck. They're often narrow and biased. I mean, you know this, you talk about this all the time. They're often narrow and biased and parochial. Why don't we instead try to build AI that will have better morals than we do? And I think he's right. I think it'd be a better thing to do that. But I end the article by saying nobody's going to want to do that. We're not going to want to have. AI that's more moral than we are, that stops us from doing things like, I don't know, like eat meat or mm-hmm. uh, break our promises or declare war. Mm-hmm. We want AI ultimately to be our servant. We want guardrails in place so it doesn't kill us. But for the most part, we want it to do what we tell it to do, not to do the right thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a, a, a kind of not, not quite direct pushback. I have something I want to say about that. Uh, First, I would say, um, I mean, to set the context more broadly, uh, this, the whole long-termism thing uh, is connected, has become connected to effective altruism, Yeah, is seen as an extension of it. And it figured in this whole Sam Altman uh, attempted deposing, uh, and that was cast to some extent accurately, to some extent not, as uh some EA people uh on the board thinking that he was uh being too reckless and and uh could not be counted on to keep AI safe maybe uh, i think there was some of that at least on the part of one board member um and of course EA has also uh been um implicated in the t- uh, it- its biggest public relations crisis came in the in the form of Sam Bankman-Fried, yeah. who had, uh, you know, wor- had donated a lot to EA, justified his trying to earn as much money as possible on grounds of EA, had been, uh, you know, was very much a Will McCaskill kind of ally yeah. and supporter. And by the way, I mean, not to suggest that my credentials for discussing EA are virtually unparalleled, but do you know which philosopher lies at the very root of the effective altruism movement? Peter Singer? 
Yes. And do you know who I had lunch with only hours ago, Paul? I hope it was a vegetarian lunch. You know, it was funny. We went to a vegan place that I didn't know of and the burritos, the chicken, scare quotes, chicken burritos, taste like chicken. Tastes like chicken. It's, it's, a, good, it's a good step. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, Peter, that's, that, that's impressive. I've met, I met Peter on a few occasions and I think the world of him. Yeah, I do too. Uh, so, um, but I digress. I have, I have pushback. Now, now you tell me, would it be like, as you know, you and I have a common interest in being uh, commercially mercenary, right? Because any moment now, you're going to put a paywall up in your newsletter. You haven't, small potatoes, you haven't done that yet or have you? Not yet. I'm waiting to get a certain amount of followers. And then, yeah. Ah, you know, I say mm -hmm. jump. I say coming in the water is fine. I, I honestly, we could talk about strategy, but I yeah. don't. Um, anyway, uh, as you know, I'm, I have a paywall. And so as a result, at some point in the podcast, I say, this has been the public part of the podcast. Thank you very much. The rest is for paid subscribers of non-zero newsletter, which you can become, become by Googling non-zero and Substack or by clicking the link in your uh, show notes uh, for your podcast app. Then you can get a, a feed, a, a, a distinctive podcast feed that'll always give you the overtime segments, all the podcasts. I say that at some point. Is it like unforgivable to say, I've got pushback, but pay up if you want to hear it? <laughs> Is that bad? I think I think it's uh, I think it's charming, and I, I'm very curious. I'm, I'm I'm glad I'm I'm glad I'm here. I'm glad I don't have to make the choice of whether or not to pay. But well, no, I, could I think blame, that's okay. I could I could blame you for it. But and and because this is now officially your podcast, you are in charge as you've established. I don't seem to get a cut out of this, though. Eh, it's the joy of serving that, that oh, okay. is motivating you. Um, that's what Sam Altman said. I don't have any equity. I just love this work. Yeah, and then apparently it wasn't entirely true. Well, your as, your, your, your future guest Gary as Marcus as will point out that will uh, point out that he has a stake in Y Combinator, which has a stake in uh, OpenAI. Yeah. That Sam Altman has that say. Uh, oh, I don't know. I almost, uh, I should give people a taste of pushback, I guess. Um, you can maybe cut off just before my response. Oh, yeah, that's what we'll do. Okay, so here's what I would say. I, I think maybe I wrote down that part of, well, you did two things. And this is another plug for your uh, newsletter, Small Potatoes. You kind of uh, did the Cliff Notes version, as we used to say. You summarized your argument um, pretty briefly and uh, extended it a little, your New Yorker argument. And I think this is a quote from your newsletter. I'm not sure. You say, uh, but we don't want to bend to a morality better than our own, as you were just saying. What would it be like to work with an AI that refused to carry out certain instructions because it viewed them as morally wrong? even in cases where we thought they were perfectly fine. Would a government be happy with military AIs that refuse to wage wars it considers unjust? Would businesses be comfortable with AIs that refuse to aid in the production of products that they see as wasteful or destructive? What if an AI acted to give more priority to the suffering of non-human species? So what I would like to see AI do, and I wrote about this long ago in the newsletter, but uh, is not uh, necessarily possess this superior morality. And I want to talk to you about how it would even go about deciding what that was. But, um, but uh, when we have agreed on the rules, maybe a good role for AI, I'm not sure, would be to adjudicate border disputes and so on, things that lead to wars. Because it's very hard, or to take a, a, another example, the World Trade Organization, which is now more or less broken down, but for some years it was successfully adjudicating uh, tariff disputes and so preventing apparently trade wars. And its rulings were respected, but eventually it got caught up in politics and, oh, it's the, the adjudicatory board is biased because it's loaded with these kinds of countries, whatever. Um, you can imagine AI uh, doing that kind of thing and uh, just taking it out of human hands and we agree in advance on what the rules are. Um, and so 
And, and yet you might wind up with the same kind of objection from people. They'd say, wait a second, we're going to let an AI tell us that we can't uh, retaliate for this, uh, you know, that we, we yeah. can't uh, launch drone strikes. And I'd say, well, you know, we already we already agree to treaties that in principle bind us that way. And it's only kind of far right sovereigntists who say we should never do that. And uh, this this and the argument is, even though treaties constrain your country, sometimes you've decided mm -hmm. that in the long run, they're good for your country. You win some, you lose some, but they're good for your country on balance. And that's what you'd be saying here. Wait, paywall is descending, Paul. <laughs> okay. Don't say anything. The paywall is descending. Okay, I just say it's just my response is devastating, but also witty. Ooh. Oh, boy, what I'd pay to hear that. Yeah. Um, so thanks to everybody who's listened this far. It's a lot of content. It's just, this is almost an hour. hour. This is ridiculous. But we'll go on for quite a while. I got a lot to say about almost everything. And um, uh, And thanks. Certainly the people who are going to follow us into overtime because they are paid subscribers. It's a non-zero newsletter. And soon, soon, folks, but at some point, being a paid subscriber to Small Potatoes will also get you over the paywall you encounter in uh, Bob Paul Podcast. That's true. That's true. Okay, now we're in okay. overtime.